Race and Class in the Ruins of Empire is the subtitle. The title is Natives. And, mm-hmm. Carlo, I have to tell you, that, that subtitle there grabbed me. Um, mm-hmm. You've only just given me this, so I'm not going to make any apologies for not having had time to that's read it. Yeah, that's right. It's better than pretending that I yeah, have no, for the course of the next yeah, hour. But, but I, when I saw it on the sort of coming up publishers list, mm. it seems to me, and I am, a, you know, a fully paid up member of the metropolitan liberal elite, and I'm a, a white bloke that went to public school, but everything at the moment seems to be revolving around race and class, possibly in the ruins of empire, but, yeah. but certainly in the in the context of where we are. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if necessarily in the ruins, it depends how nostalgic we are about empire. The fact of the matter is, in the scheme of the world, Britain is still a fairly decent country to live in. Yes. And so it's ironic. Don't get me wrong, there are tremendous problems in Britain, of course, but it's, it's very interesting for some people the loss of empire and that sort of nostalgia of this thing that they think was wonderful. This time prior to 1945, when they believed Britain was a sort of this sort of lily white, idyllic, wonderful place where everyone got on. Forget about the cholera, forget about the six-year-olds going up chimneys, forget about how many centuries it took for poor people to get, to get the right to vote, forget about all of the real conflicts that created the, the modern society. This is to say nothing of empire yet. Um, a sort of romanticization of the past is quite dangerous. Mm. Um, and so I think that that, kind of imperial nostalgia feeds into a lot of the threads that we're talking about today and a lot of the contradictions and the way in which the British state plays race against class. So if you can convince someone in Sunderland that the problem is a nurse from Bangladesh and not the people who actually control the power and the resources and the distribution of that power and those resources, even though the north of England has been poorer than the south for virtually all of recorded history because of this accident called the Thames, it, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. You know these people who've come. People need escape, though. And I think what, when, in a post-imperial society like like this one, the as we've seen spe- so so spectacularly recently, you know people who appear to be different often mm. provide a very convenient uh, front escape of the queue. Yeah. Front of the queue. Let's let's start at the beginning. Um, born to a Scottish mother and a Jamaican father. Yes. Parents split up, mm-hmm. but dad was around. Yeah, yeah. It's not a kind yeah. of cliche. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah. But no, you I've... begin the book by almost playing into the stereotype. I think. Quite, grew yeah, up quite. in the sing, in the cliched single parent working class family, but that's just the number of parents that were living under your roof. Your dad wasn't an absence. Correct. Also, I did for the first eight years of my life uh, grow up with my stepdad. Right. And so the, the the point of the whole book is that on paper, if you just present you know the stats, free school meals, yeah. inner city, you know immigrant, etc., where my life should have ended up and, and where 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 it may have ended up, but but for a few different ingredients. Um, and where it has a, a quite disparate. And part of that is the role of the men in my life. Also, my godfather, who, to whom mm. the book is dedicated, he doesn't know that yet. Does he not? Um, <laughs> he, he was just a family friend, but yes. he became so close to the family that when my mom got very, very sick, when I was you know, 10 years old, she was, she was supposed to die. He signed the papers to say, look, if they don't want to move and live, because my dad lives in West Sussex, I wasn't keen on moving to West Sussex, right? So he was like, I'll have the kids kind of thing. So there were, there were male role models around. I don't, I don't think that is, that's often a very easy go-to sort of cliche. Um, but, but reality is often much more complex than that, even in families that have split up. My dad went and had another family in West Sussex and they were together f- and still are together now. Do you, do you know what I mean? So it was, yes. it was, it was much more complicated than, 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 those kind of papers, as all families are. Uh, uh, but there's a, there's an appeal. You can see why simplicity is compelling. Oh, I, course, I mean, yeah. in terms of how do you fix a problem, you need to be given something that feels achievable. Yeah, and, sure. and male role models is quite an easy fit for the idea that if you could only somehow ensure that young black kids in particular yeah, had more sure. male role models, then yeah. they would get into less trouble. And also, I think, and that's not to say that, that male role models isn't, isn't part of... Uh, a wider issue, but it's also to suggest that families occur outside of the context of the society that they're in. So, for example, if we look at my family's history, yes, my grandmother comes to the country, like most Caribbeans of her generation, doesn't find employment commensurate with her level of intelligence. Or Which, and she was education. expecting to. I think we're all on a bit of a crash course. They were, they were very shocked. They, they genuinely expected to... It sounds terribly naive now, right? Does it? Well, yeah, because if you know the last history of the last 70 years, they expected when they left the Caribbean, Mm. they they were British citizens. And remember, they were being taught at school. Yes. They went to British schools in Jamaica. So they're being taught that they're British. They have a British passport, exactly the same as all the other British passports. Picture the Queen on the classroom. Right. All it says is British passport, Jamaica. Yeah. yeah? Or if you're in Grenada, Grenada. So they leave. Remember, they pay for themselves. As I've explained to people, there's a sort of population swap that occurred. Mm. There were people leaving Britain, going to the colonies at the cost of the Commonwealth taxpayer, about 1.5 million people. There were people coming from Europe, Ireland, Italy, Germany, Poland. 
the ones that came from continental Europe, not Ireland, I'm not sure what happened with them, but the ones that came from continental Europe received also state subsidy to come here. So then you have this other group of people who are paying for themselves and contributing as British taxpayers, and then are received not just by the public. What, what, what the state has commonly done is given us this impression that ignorant working class people were just so racist, the state sort of had to give in. Mm. And there's no doubt that there was a bit of that mentality there. Any Windrush generation person will tell you that. But the state had decided, if you if you read the documents, their own archive, unless they forged their own archive to make themselves look more racist than they were, they had decided <laughs> from the moment the boat arrived yeah. that these people would never really be citizens. So Atlee's government referred to the literal passengers on the Windrush as an incursion and said that steps needed to be taken so that no further influxes were encouraged. These are British citizens, yeah. taxpayers, mostly skilled workers. You know, So the only thing that was abnormal about them quote unquote, was, was their blackness. So we so, were in English speaking, culturally, they were more English than the people coming, say, from Germany, Italy or Poland. But they were the wrong colour. Yeah. So what, what I was going to say about fathers in, in that context, you know, my gran, God bless my gran, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this, but, you know, my gran has, you know, some personal, emotional and, and mental problems. Yeah. My dad goes into care for a couple of years. Sure. Now, the care system in the 70s, well, let's let's put it like this. About 150,000 British kids were, were trafficked to Australia up until the 1970s, from the end of the war to the 70s. So if we imagine that's what was happening to ethnically white British kids mm. in, that, in that period, you can imagine what the care yeah. system was like for, for a black guy in the 70s. That doesn't, you know, free my dad or anyone else from any of their human flaws, but my family didn't exist outside of the context of the wider society, is, is what I'm saying. My mum gets with a black guy, her dad's not too happy about it, kicks her out of the house. And so some of my family issues are not... Uh, are not irrelevant to the wider societal context within which they occur. Even big macroeconomic things, you know, I, re I read a stat recently that a child, someone born in 1981, I was born in 83, hmm. has half the average net worth by 30 as someone born in 1976. Yeah. So these big macroeconomic changes. This my is big my gran worked, like, my gran cleaned toilets and she yeah. bought a house in King's Cross. It's incredible, isn't it? Like in King's Cross. Yeah. Now, can you imagine? Like, no. That's literally physically impossible. So bigger changes affect... You can buy a house anywhere, let alone right. in King's Cross, if you were, if you were doing manual e labour there. Exactly. Did you talk to your grandma then? Yeah, we're very up close. About oh, this. So, so you were presumably the least surprised person in the country when the Windrush scandal broke in well, the last few weeks. I was I was completely unsurprised yeah. also because it, it wasn't a scandal of the last few weeks for me. No, that's, that's what for I'm me, picking For me, for lots of other people, we've been talking about this for many years because... The deportations didn't only start a few weeks ago. Mm. So obviously these are people's uncles, these are people's aunties, these are family members. Um, but I was aware, not because of my grand actually, a lot of the Windrush generation, they don't talk about what happened in that generation. Why not? F for a number of reasons. One, because when they left the Caribbean, remember these were upwardly mobile people, yes. especially the lot that came between 48 and 55, which wasn't actually my grand, but the first lot that came the British government in Jamaica feared they were losing their best people. Yeah, brain drain. Right, because these were, obviously, if you could even fill in the forms, bear sure. in mind, when, so at the end of British rule, literacy in the Caribbean was still below 30%. So the people that could even fill in the forms, let's just start there, were not from the, the kind of uneducated no. um, subset of Caribbean society. So they leave expecting opportunities, expecting better education, expecting all of this stuff. And in a way, a lot of them just couldn't cope with the rejection. So a lot of people wanted to go back and instead of going back, what they did instead was they worked their arse off and sent money and what we call barrels mm. back home that they actually couldn't afford to send. Sure. Because they couldn't admit to people back home what a failure the expedition had been. And so my gran and lots of her generation, if you actually talk to them, they're not very free with what they think and feel about that period. So a lot of what I've learned, even though nuggets have come from my gran here and there, my granddad, rest in peace, he's not, he's not around anymore, but... Um, a lot of it has actually come from books and from studying those who were willing to talk, a CLR James or Claudia Jones or sure. people who did write about that period. Um, uh, Peter Fryer even, who's a, who's a Yorkshireman, a white Yorkshireman who wrote perhaps the definitive history of, of black people in Britain. So that's where I've made sense of my grand's experiences is from scholarship a lot of the time. What age were you when you started seeking out that sort of scholarship? Well, I was lucky. So in the 60s, um, the Caribbean community who came to Britain as part of this reaction. Yeah. They were very dissatisfied with the level of education their children were receiving in Britain schools, partly because of institutionalized racism, but partly ironically because because in the Caribbean you had to educate a middle class civil service. Ironically, a black Caribbean migrant was probably better educated than a lot of poor people in England. Mm. So they've come to England expecting to get an upgrade as Caribbean civil servants or as Nigerian civil servants might have done in the last 20 or 30 years and instead essentially got an educational downgrade and so as part of the reaction to that they set up 
what we call Pan-African Saturday schools. So set up special Saturday schools for black kids to help with maths and English and teach African history and all this sort of stuff. Um, there were about 150 of them at sort of peak. Every Caribbean community in Britain had one till quite recently, some still do. I went to one of those as a child. And so I had some support and some insulation from a lot of the negativity. So, But what this meant on the other side was that these kind of issues that I'm writing about now, mm. I was really very aware of at six, seven, eight, nine years old because of my Black Saturday school. And so in a way, I think that what I'm trying to do with the book is for young working class kids in general and young working class black kids in particular is to say, look, no one's saying that personal responsibility doesn't matter, but personal responsibility occurs in a context. And one of the greatest things that I think happened to me was I was not deluded into believing that Britain was a meritocracy. Right. Is Britain a, a better society than maybe France? Probably, or Italy in terms of these contradictions, perhaps. That doesn't mean the country is flat on meritocratic. That doesn't mm. mean everyone gets the same chances. It would be ridiculous to tell a kid in Easter House in Glasgow, one of the poorest neighbors in Western Europe, he has the same life opportunities as a kid in High Street Kensington. Sure. Even in Kensington, to tell yeah, a kid yeah. in Grenfell yeah, yeah, that yeah. they have the same opportunities as the people in Holland Park, which mm. are 30 seconds away, mm. is ridiculous. And so for me, one of the great benefits was my parents, my Pan-African Saturday School, the entire sort of radical Caribbean intelligentsia that was working class people, but was very much an intelligentsia that I was part of. My stepdad was a stage manager of a Hackney Empire. So I saw loads of theater growing up. They never deluded me into believing I would get the same opportunities as everyone else. How so, did they articulate that? How do they, because it's quite a bleak message to give a child. It's but, almost but, the opposite of what some people would consider to be the path to aspiration. But but is it? I mean, saying to a kid, yeah, you have to work twice as hard. That's just the reality. I, They're I, still, I, still entertaining the possibility that you, you that work would be rewarded. They weren't telling you, yeah, no, don't they bother, because you're never going to get through that. Correct. Right. They were never saying, oh, racism exists. Oh, you're born poor, so just give up and go back know to your bed. place. That, that was not what they were saying at all. They right. were saying, work twice as hard, do better in school. Or as my great... My good friend, uh, M.K. Sani, one, one of the great scholars, African-American scholars, he, he says, take two sets of notes. That's, yeah. just, that's just the game. Like, there's plenty of... I think part of the problem we have in, in Britain is that there are plenty of nation states, maybe all nation states in the world, where there is some minority who the state doesn't like and serve as a useful scapegoat. Perhaps because we believe our own PR is why we're surprised here, but mm. it isn't a surprise in France, it isn't a surprise in China, it isn't a surprise in India with the Sikhs or the Kashmiris. Where do you think the PR comes from? I, I think... I think I mean, every state probably has the PR well, as well. In, in a saying, sense, but you're right. We but have a slightly more, well, I much more sophisticated. Well, power. The greater your power, the greater your ability to craft self-image. So, if you if you are the first truly global mm. empire, if you conquer a quarter of the world's sur uh, Earth's surface, and if you no doubt about it, I mean, remove the empire just for a minute. Not that you can, but some of Britain's intellectual, cultural achievements are undeniably impressive. Mm. All of the kind of racism and conquering would mean nothing if Newton hadn't existed, if Darwin hadn't existed, if Shakespeare hadn't existed. So it's, it's one with the other. It's not as simple as saying, "Oh, Britain went around and conquered everyone," and therefore you, you still have sure. to have some fruit at the end of it. And I yes. think I think that combination of and this goes for Western Europe in general. I'm not one of these people who seeks to deny that Western Europe's intellectual, cultural, scientific achievements across the last half a millennia are impressive. I just deny the racist propaganda they were used to justify. Song China was impressive. They were printing books 600 years before people were printing books in Europe or medieval Mali or, or uh, the kings of Mesopotamia were being elected to serve fixed terms in 2500 BC. And this is what you were learning at your Saturdays? No, not all of this. Some but, of this is, some of this is I got older. So but you, you, I mean, you're self-taught then. But, but yeah, I mean, I didn't go uni. I, be, I barely finished college. We've, we've, you've done, I knew this was going to happen. We've yeah. been here 15 minutes. You're yeah. jumping around so much. Yeah. Um, I want to get the arc of yeah. your life. Yeah, go ahead. Let's, let's, Cause, cause yeah. I, I'm, I'm seeing the fruits of your learning without yeah. understanding where, where the learning came from. So how, let's start with a simple question. How old were you when you realised you were particularly clever? Um, well, it's, it's, it's hard because I think that... I always was lucky enough to know cleverness was relative. So for example, my older sister is incredible at drawing and sculpture and art. I still draw, I would say an average three-year-old. Like, I'll draw you a picture and you'll say, he's gotta be joking. My handwriting's really, really bad. But I'm not gonna like, sit here and be overly humble either and say I didn't know that no, I was kind of bright. I won't let you. In, in a sense, because ironically, because I went to a very mixed school, not just uh, racially, but economically, yes. we had lots of, we basically had, the wealthy white parents who didn't want to send their kids to private school right. went to this kind of school that I went to, okay. right? And so what it meant very early, I was like, hold on a minute, you know, this person lives up on Highgate Hill and they've got a big detached house and, you know, they've clearly got lots more money than we have, even though they live five minutes up the street. 
but they're actually not any cleverer than I am. And in a, in a sense, more so than my cousins who went to school in Brixton or Hackney, who went to essentially segregated schools in mm. everything but name, if not just racially, but also economically. I, I saw very early the difference in treatment more than perhaps they would. Yes. Because I got put in the special needs group for kids who didn't speak English when I was seven, which is what one of the chapters in the book's mm. about. Why? Uh, because I think one particular teacher, and it's not to put her in a bad we're apple We're jumping sense. again. This is, I'm gonna, no, but this is the arc yeah, of no, the life, no, no, right? So in that, in that period, for this particular teacher, I was too bright for my own good. Yeah. And, and, and in fairness to her, I think it's too easy to say, oh, you one individual bigot, you bad woman. She was born in the 1930s, yeah? So this is the 1980s. Yeah. She's brought up a time when the idea that Europeans were genetically superior to everyone else was considered a scientific fact, rather uncontroversial. It's too easy. It, it's very easy, as I, as I say in the book. I say, look, it's understandable in that context, in that imperial context as well, the, the subjection of what we call subject races. Even in a highly class stratified society, remember British education was never even equal for all white people. No. Kids in East Glasgow were never given the same education as kids who go to Eton. So the idea that black migrants to Britain were being educated to become you know, the next Roger Penrose or the next Richard Dawkins, it's ridiculous. We're not even educating poor white kids to do that. So, mm. so why, would that, why would we think that would be on offer to, to black immigrants to the country? You can do it if you're David Ajay and you, I don't know whether he went to private school or what happened in his family, there'll be exceptions. Yes. So what was happening was I was being rewarded actually. So the special needs group they put me in, they gave me hot chocolate and biscuits, didn't tell my parents. This is how you know, they knew I didn't have special needs. And it was actually my Pan-African Saturday school who noticed that my behavior had started to slip, that my grades had started to slip, who happened to be visiting my school one day for one of the other children, who noticed that I'm not in regular classes. Mm. And they tell my mum, then my mum comes up to school and goes wild. And it's the teacher herself who sat kind of says, you know, she also she also struck me with a ruler and, and, a, and a book. And she said, oh, I admit to hitting him, but, but it's not because he's brown. So she brought that, it wasn't even my mum who brought it to the table. And so what I try and do in the book is put that in the context of a class stratified and racially stratified education it's very system. forgiving. Who? You. No, not, not necessarily. What, what I'm saying is what I try to use is my... No, because I think it's too easy. It's not that I'm being forgiven. It's too easy to blame the individual teacher. So you're going for the explain I, I, rather I, I, than excuse. I'm say, yeah, exactly. Okay. I'm not saying that that's okay what she did. She could have ruined my life. You know, yeah. If I stayed in there for but a whole year. she didn't do it because she's an evil person. Well, she, she did it because she'd been conditioned a particular way. And um, you can't be the scholar that you are unless you acknowledge everybody else's looking at the world through the lens of their own experiences. Yeah, look, for her, she would be a traitor to her race and her nation and her culture if she taught me that I was to expect the best fruits of British society. And this is one of the problems for little brown kids who are a bit too clever, yeah. is, is, and boys particularly. How much of this would you have been processing at the time? Um, more, than, more of it than a usual child because of my Saturday school. Yes. And so because of my Saturday school, I, I got to see the difference between... The Caribbean kids who went to Saturday school and those who didn't even. Okay, and yeah. the difference in outcome was, was I mean, my cousin who had a much more tougher upbringing than I did even, he also took his maths GCSE a yearly and got 10 GCSEs. It's not a fluke. I've got nine siblings. Yeah. Eight of us got 10 GCSEs. Yeah. I don't know how many kids on free school meals get five, but I think it's something like 30% or less. Oh, that's astonishing. So, so yeah. eight of my 10 siblings got 10. And my cousin, who also went to Pan-African Saturday School, is my Jamaican cousin. He also got 10 and also took his master's GCSE a year early. So there was this support. It's kind of real. And these are working class I, people. I, I, this, I don't know if you can answer this question. I've never heard of Pan-African Saturday yeah, Schools yeah. before. For good reason. Why? Because it's easier to give the impression that black people just don't care about education. Because then we don't have to explain the problems that we're seeing in Hackney or Brixton. And or why Tottenham. you need the alternative or the augmentation that's right. provided. Well, I mean, why, if, if, if people, if Caribbeans came to this country with a lack of value for education, with a lack of value for family, just wanting to be gangbangers and go to jail, mm. why did they bother setting up 150 Saturday schools? Why did all virtually, ask anyone of my age, the difference between our grandparents and our parents, almost all of our grandparents stayed married till their dying day, even if they shouldn't have, because yes. it was frowned upon back yes. then. What, what we've got to deal with is people, the same, a lot of the same people understand how, 70s and 80s Thatcherism and that tumultuous period in British history, the collapse of the golden age of capitalism and all of that. People understand how that affected mining communities in the north. People understand how that affected East Glasgow. People understand how that affected Belfast. Suddenly don't understand how that affected Caribbeans who were concentrated in exactly the same time type of manufacturing jobs. Yeah. And I find that quite fascinating that that's hard to understand. So if you go to a lot of the former mining towns of the north, mm. perhaps not on the same scale as London right now, but what will you see? You'll see alcoholism, you'll see drug addiction, you'll see low education, you'll see violence. You'll see many of the same problems that you see in Hackney, just in a completely different demographic. And 
apparently Caribbean immigrants to Britain are subject to different laws to all other human beings. And it, it, it's sufficient to say they brought this culture with them. And as I was, I was arguing with a conservative woman on Twitter today, she didn't respond, obviously, because <laughs> she has no argument. She says, you know, there's some cultures that have fatherlessness at their core. And I said, OK, can you provide me just any data on the level of single parent households in the actual Caribbean migrants that came from the Caribbean? So not their great grandchildren. No, the, the original. So, so if, if, if the problem was fatherlessness that we brought with us, then you'd expect the violence, the problems. And, and actually, the state in the post-war period commissioned a number of studies actually to try and prove that Caribbean migrants were a drain on British resources, that they were more likely to commit crime, all of which concluded the exact opposite. So the government didn't report them. They didn't release them publicly because they literally concluded no, over 95% of them are gamefully employed yes. and they're no more likely to commit crime than anyone else. And, and if we acknowledge that, then we're the ones with questions to answer. Then now in this... Con and that doesn't free black people of self-responsibility. I have a no, lot no, of no, self-respect. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not like, oh, you know, Mighty Whitey is responsible for everything that's gone wrong in the world or in my, my life. That's not the argument. What I'm saying is for kids in East Glasgow, even along a class level, for kids in Crockstuff in Liverpool to not acknowledge how their communities came to be the way they are is not helping them. So it, it has to be a combination of, yes, of course you have to work twice as hard in school. You can't expect, unfortunately, the world is not fair. You can't expect something back for nothing, for giving nothing. At the same time, I've got to be honest with you and say to you, no, the world isn't fair. So I, you, I haven't really, this hadn't occurred to me before. So I'm just thinking of all the symptoms of what, of what, you, what you're describing. And obviously you've got addiction, you've got dysfunction, you've got violence, you've got single endemic single parenthood, mm -hmm. all of which would apply to what I would, I guess it's slightly unpleasant, but it's an easily understood phrase. You, you, you'd apply that to your kind of Jeremy Kyle demographic <laughs> without ever stopping to wonder why we just presume that it's colour related for African Caribbean families. Well, we presume that in London. I mean, if you go and ask people who live in the roughest council estates in Scotland, they call them schemies up there instead yeah, yeah. of chavs, yeah, right? Of so, so, so even if we were not here, yes. it would be someone else. Before yes. we got here, the it, was same the, it was the Jews and the Irish before we mm. got here. Jewtown in East London at the turn of the century, the, the, there, were, there were a couple of acts of, of anarchist terrorism, and that was blamed on the entire Jewish community. Crime, knife crime itself, was said to be endemically Irish. Mm. Do you see what I mean? So th mm. this is not a new issue. Irish immigrants before... No, but it, 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 bits of it are. Because bits of it I know, and, and yeah. I, I, I'm struggling to keep up with you, I'm not going to lie, which is quite a novel experience for me. <laughs> so what, 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 I'm, what I'm hearing is yeah. a little bit guilt-inducing, if I'm honest, because what, it had never really occurred to me before that the problems within the black community in London were the same problems that you see within poor communities in other cities, yeah. and that they were a result of having the certainties that were provided by the combination of, of, of welfare state mm -hmm. and a proper concept of society mm -hmm. pulled from beneath the feet of your parents' generation mm -hmm. um, without any safety net being put in place. But, but also there were specific policies, and this is where, and this, again, like I said, none of this is often an excuse, but you can even look at the difference in education outcome today yes. between later migrants who predominantly came from West Africa, who actually do significantly better in school yes. than both poor white and black English. The black English are deliberately mislabeled Caribbeans, yes. even though a lot of them have never been back to the Caribbean. Sure. This is the other problem. A lot of these kids who have been labeled Caribbean in the press have never visited Jamaica no. or Trinidad or Barbados. And if you look at educational outcomes, I mean, Barbados has something like 99% adult literacy. Mm. St. Lucia has the highest number of Nobel it's Prize. Just, it's just convenient. No, highest number of Nobel Prize winners is per right? capita in the world, St. Right? Lucia. Jamaica, despite being one of the poorest countries in the world, again, if you look at the educational output of the tiny fraction of Jamaicans that actually go to university, they're astronomically more intelligent than their cousins that live in Britain. And interestingly, American, right-wing black Americans like Thomas Sowell, for example, his argument in America is the exact opposite. He says Caribbean immigrants into America doing so well in school proves that the problem in America is not institutionalised racism because, look, the Caribbeans have done so well. So how is it our literal cousins that went to America apparently valued education, yes. but the ones that came here didn't? So again, these structural issues, we're, we're sort of... No, no one's saying that that excuses people from personally doing anything with their life, but to ignore the difference uh, in, uh, as the original point I was making was, that if later migrants from West Africa are doing significantly better in school... Then something's happened. But if you look at the way the press reacts to that, mm. the press reaction to that has been poor white boys left behind in the school system. Yes, it has. When, when the reaction should be, shouldn't we be teaching... Now, the reason why we know that's a, that's a racist reaction is because... Black boys, mixed heritage boys, and poor white boys, black English boys, that is, fail at almost an identical rate now. Like It's mm. like 1% or 2% ahead the black English boys are, and apparently that, that means the white boys are left behind. Yeah. Shouldn't we all be saying, 
why don't we all follow the West African kids and the Bangladeshi kids yes. who still have that cultural value of education rather than say we've been left but behind? That's quite depressing, isn't it? Because that suggests that the, uh, the, the, the value of education was diminished in that generational uh, of course. gap. So that, so that you, you came over, Windrush generation came over. The, the, it's a bit of a trite anecdote, but there's a great line in um, Andrea Levy's book about I think one of the heroes of her book had lost a brother in the war who'd been flying Spitfires, and he just presumed that this would afford him heroic status when he got here, mm -hmm. that it would somehow mean that you know he'd get mm -hmm. treated mm -hmm. as being a bit special because his brother mm -hmm. had made the ultimate sacrifice. And, and when you realise the reality is that you're expected to know your place and you're expected to toe the line and you're also expected to, to endure some pretty grim attitudes, education suddenly doesn't seem to be the the key to the kingdom that it was for previous generations. And that even subconsciously gets passed on to the next generation. So then when the West African kids arrive, for them, the key is still real. Yeah, of course. And and we, we can literally see that an outcome. Yes. Give it two more generations. What it is, is... What happens? No, don't, don't jump ahead. Give, give it what give, happens give it, after two more generations. Give it two more generations and what will happen is they'll become acculturated. So right. the, the Ghanaian and Nigerian parents who are currently like, if you don't get a degree, yes. you better leave my home. Yes. The more English you become... And that's not because the, the British class system needs it only needs two, three percent of the, edu the the public to be properly educated. Yes, I know. The Etonians and the, the kind of Oxbridge set, are the, that's all you need to run the country efficiently. So lambasting kind of more working class communities for not becoming Roger Penrose or Richard Dawkins when we're not encouraging them to do so anyway. We don't have a public language it's, that encourages it's, weird, that. it's very strange. It is very strange, not least because we're, we're jumping around so much, but that's we right. might as well go all in. Yeah, yeah. We're, we, we seem now to be seeing an education system that's even more geared or is becoming more geared by every year towards education being a means to an end rather than an end in itself. So what you've just described almost contradicts that, even though what you describe is accurate, because that 2 to 3% of people being needed to, to run the country, that means that you have to render education something that's a reward in and of itself rather than just a, a path to professional advancement. And yet our education system, especially mm -hmm. at tertiary level, is now almost devaluing everything that can't be immediately translated into, into material benefit or the, the degrees yeah. that don't deliver a job immediately. I think if, if, if the Brexit trajectory continues, they'll mm -hmm. be the ones you have to pay for soon and you might be able to go to medical school or engineering mm -hmm. school for free. It's, it's a strange sort of state of affairs. And it's even stranger to primarily lay the blame at the people who don't have any power to make all of those decisions. But if you can persuade the white people who, as you've just said, that the, their problems are actually caused by people like you, then nothing ever needs to get fixed. Yeah, but I think what's, what's fascinating, again, like I said, is how the state plays... Do you think that's... Because I, 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 I've got, I'll tell you where I am politically yeah. at the moment. I'm on this weird... What do you call it? Almost like the top of a pyramid. I'm not quite sure which way I'm going to roll because to, to think of it as all being deliberate, it's quite it's it's close to conspiracy, and yet the evidence mounts, especially with regard to the Windrush yeah. story that we've seen. That's the tip of a of an iceberg. I think I there's mean, a lot more to come out on this, yeah. as you will think, as you will already know. Yeah. But the the idea that it was a deliberate plan with an end game. I find almost too sinister to believe. Which is understandable, given your lived experience. Yes. The first time I was searched by the police, I was 12. Yes. There was no adult present. I wasn't read my rights. When I, taught, when I tried to... So a teacher at my school gave us, all of the young black boys in our school, he gave us a form with our rights on it because he knew he was going to get searched by the police at some point. So it's like, it doesn't matter what your grades are. I mean, you can be like me and go to the Royal Institution. I actually got searched. I talk about this once in the book. Yeah. I got searched on my way to the Royal Institution Math and Max Masterclasses once. And that was when it hit me. It was like respectability politics don't mean anything because I was born in the bottom one or two percent of, you know, socioeconomically mm. speaking. Academically, I was in the top one or two percent. It didn't change the fact that some of the people with the power just saw a criminal. And this was before I, I did become a bit of a naughty boy myself. And part of that trajectory was being treated like a criminal. But the point, the point I'm making is, is that for me, especially going to the kind of school I went to, I saw who was bringing drugs into school and who wasn't. And I saw who was getting searched and who wasn't. And the kids bringing drugs into school were the ones who could afford it. Yeah. Class A drugs anyway. Yeah. You know, the, the, the man, you know, they used to buy weed, I'm not going to lie. But in terms of drugs, drugs, sure. you know, it, it wasn't us. And so it was, it was very clear to me very early that 
the, the, lud- the lunacy of sort of ethnically targeted stop and search, which we want to bring back. When you even look at the numbers now, what this does is it doesn't help solve the problem. It helps make the problem worse for reasons that should be entirely common sense. Let's say there's roughly a million black people in London. I think it's like 800,000 somewhere in that region. Let's say there's 40, 50 murders a year, but let's just do it easy math, yeah, right? 50 sure. murders, because yeah. it's actually less than 50 usually. That means five in every 100,000, or to put it another way, 0.005% or whatever that is, actually kill somebody. Yeah. And if you look at the police's own report, so research in this book, I did a lot of uh, look at police's own reports from the days of Operation Trident. And in the reports they actually deliver, they understand very well the type of young black boys that are likely to kill people are not random at all. When sure. you adjust for abuse in the home, when you adjust for expulsion from school, crucially, you start to see, oh, they're the same socioeconomic demographic as the kids who've been doing this in Glasgow or Liverpool mm. or Sheffield in the 1920s or, or Middlesbrough. But we can ignore all of that. And so ironically, treating the other 85, 90% of young black boys in Hackney who just want to go to school and get a job like criminals actually prevents us from allocating the resources where they need to go, which is helping the most vulnerable people. And the worst part about it is, if you're a kid, like my little cousin, for example, and you live on a council estate in Hackney, this hasn't happened to him, but this is this is very common, and you've been robbed two or three times growing up, you know, mm-hmm. boys have pulled a knife out and you took <clears> your mobile phone, then you get searched by the police because of the very boys you're getting bullied by. Yes. Of course you're going to be peed off. This yes. is natural. If we, t- if we said, let's put it like this, as example I always give people, if we took the case of Jimmy Savile and Rolf Harris and whoever else, and we said, right, all middle-aged white guys in TV are potential pedophiles, yeah. and let's police Andrew Neil on the assumption when he goes to pick up his grandkids, let's just stop and make sure they're his grandkids just in case because of what Jimmy Savile done. Yeah. This is what you get when you get collective blame, but we sort of accept it. And it's not, again, I don't even entirely blame the public because when you have a language of public policy, when you have a language of media that emphasises race whenever there's a negative story or a significant portion of time, but not when there's a positive story. So the four youngest kids to ever take GCSEs in Britain are also black. Race was not emphasised in any of the reporting. Six-year-old Joshua Beckford from Tottenham yes. was studying philosophy at Oxford. His dad taught him. Naturally, race and certainly the black father was not emphasised, which in both cases is the case. So again, with the West African kids who are doing very, very well at school, yes. thousands of them, Race is not emphasized. No. It's emphasized in the negative. As they go it's like the West African kids are doing better than we are. We need to fix this. And it's very interesting because the journalists who are writing that are not concerned with poor white kids failing. If you read the, no. all the, I've got loads, I cite loads of them in there. They're concerned that poor white kids are failing relative to black kids. Yes. They're not actually concerned with poor white kids themselves. It's a sort of weird racial nationalism where we're like, we're it's, okay for the chavs to fail. It's got, it's got a f- touch of the whip hand. To yeah, it, well, it's okay it? for it's the chavs to fail, but yes, they shouldn't yes, be failing yes. more than the, the, than the immigrants yeah, kind of no. thing. And weirdly enough, for someone like me who's done a lot of educational work in poor communities, full stop, I want all young kids to do well. Like, why wouldn't we want more smart people? Like, it's, well, it's what, strange to what, me. What, what is your answer to that question? Do we go back to the 2 to 3% that you need yeah, to, you're to, to, to run a functioning we're, society? We're, we're, we're a hierarchical... And education is dangerous, which is yeah, why fascists hate it so much, 100%. because it, it, uh, imagination and empathy are the it, 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 building blocks of revolution. Educate, educate people are very, very dangerous. Mm. We're a hierarchical society. We're a post-industrial society. I mean, there's other societies... Just, just, just talk me back through... The first time you were stopped and searched yeah. when you were 12 years old. Yeah. Well, I might have been 13. It was in that year. Right. Yeah, so it was in that year, year yeah, eight at school. Sure. But I was, to be fair, to, to be fair to the police or as fair as I can be, I was a very big lad. So okay. there's no way they thought I was 12. Still. Though I did try to explain that to yeah. them. And they still shouldn't have searched so me. I, I went to school with lads who went on to play prop forward for England rugby. Yeah. They never got stopped. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. exactly. Right. I mean, but I was about this size, but I'm still not big enough for okay. a rugby player. Yeah. Clearly it wasn't that, right? <laughs> One of the officers actually said to me, so I lived in uh, near, between uh, sort of, where the Whittington Hospital was, I lived in that sort of yeah, area, okay. near Archway, yeah. Camden, sort of that, that bit. But the officer said to me, where are you from? Tottenham. So Straight you, away. So you knew what he was trying to say, right? Yes. F- from the jump. And I was like, no, I actually live, I live up there, right? And, 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 and it's interesting because I didn't tell my mum when I got home because I couldn't be bothered. Like, it was like, oh, okay, cool. I knew this was coming. Seriously. And so, yeah, because it's, it's, it's just, it's a rite of passage. And so I, I thought, uh, if I tell my mum, she's going to get upset. She's going to feel like she needs to go to the police station and tell them this was wrong. And I was just like, I just can't be bothered. It's just, it's, it's... What did they do to you? I mean, just... Nothing, they just searched me and they... they, they but you kept... say nothing, they just searched me. I've never been searched in my life. Yeah, yeah well, last time I got stopped was six months ago. So what, December. what, what happened to... Um, because it, it, this is what happens when you have a, 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 a stigmatory language. So sure. the last time I got pulled over to, to tail in the two, it was a week, literally a week. It was, it was so ironic. After the, the commissioner of the Met went on TV and said, tougher sentences for teenage thugs, mm. black men in London are 20 times more likely yeah. to be killed, which is a very selective way of presenting the information. If you're saying blackness is the common denominator, the way mm. to present the information would be to say, what percentage of black people actually kill people? Mm. And as I just showed you with the stats earlier, when you present it like that, you realise that the type of the percentage 
percentage of black people that actually kill people is significantly less than 1%, yes. which means you're going to have to offer more of a common denominator than blackness. Yeah. But when you present blackness as the common denominator, even when a significant portion of the black on black violence stats are people like me who are half white, yeah. you get a situation where police can pull over a grown man and he's 34 years old and say, gang members drive cars like this. And I'm like, well, so do people who run companies, which yes. happens to be what I am. I'm actually yes. on my way to a meeting, but, but thank you very much. I'm sure that it was the car that made you think I was a gang member. <laughs> and one of the officers, a female officer, came around the other side of the car and she recognized me. Right. And so she got terribly embarrassed. Yes. But, and then the other officers who didn't, they was like, oh, what'd you do, mate? I was like, no, no. I was like, well, if you think we've got, you know, a, a, if you've got a better suggestion, let us know. And I was like, well, actually, I'm, I'm writing to, 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 or I was preparing at the time, working with groups of young people to, to work up some yes. solutions, long-term solutions to the problem um, that communities are facing. But the point of what I'm saying is, interact. I, I already knew interaction with the police was an inevitability. And right. in, in a sense, my experience was one step better than my parents' experience. If you talk to even a lot of the Irish community of my dad's age, in go to somewhere like Kilburn, yeah. talk to Irishmen in their in the fifties, police brutality was very normal in yes. the seventies and eighties. But well, they were all terrorists. Exactly. There you go. So, in a weird way, the, one of the things I've I've, po I've been pointing out to people a lot recently, the degree to which the state legitimizes racial hierarchy in public language and policy and all that, can be seen really clearly in the difference between the way black and Irish people relate in America mm. and in Britain. So in America, the relationship is fundamentally hostile for a whole host of historical reasons. In Britain, the probably the one white community in the 70s and 80s who Caribbeans were really close to was the Irish yeah. for the exact reason that they were sort of the, even though there were loads of poor white communities, the Irish understood what it was to be targeted because of who you were, Whereas not because in, in of what America, you did. In America, they became police. There you go. So, so that relationship shows you very clearly that this, the state does influence but again, people's I, relationships. The, the, the thing that I'm going to enjoy most, I think, yeah. from, from reading more deeply into your work is this contention of, of 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 it being deliberate because that that is I, I don't want to hark on this yeah. point but the 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 evidence that you present makes it look like a plan as opposed to what i've always presumed it was and as a phone-in host you get exposed to quite a lot of um, yeah. raw prejudice and, mm -hmm. and naked course, bigotry yeah. i've always presumed that was the tail that wagged the dog whereas you're making me wonder whether actually well the, the the example with there's a very very good book called whitewashing britain by a scholar called kathleen paul and she wrote this in the 90s, I believe, because the state's own archive was now available. Yes. So, for example, if we talk about the 1962 Commonwealth Immigration Act, the act that began the process of de-citizenshipizing, whatever yeah. the word is, right? Taking away, removing the citizenship from the brown parts of the Commonwealth. The Home Secretary at the time, Rab Butler, privately said, yes. this is now a public statement, he said, its great merit was that it could be presented as non-discriminatory, when in fact its restrictive intent was intended to, and indeed would affect coloured people almost exclusively. And you do that from memory then? That's, Pre that's, that's pretty that's much a verbatim quote, there, right? Because you see, someone from my background, Rab Butler's one of the good guys. Yeah, that, that's pretty much a verbatim quote. Yeah, I believe you. Right. And so, so I mean, there might be a, a word or two that's slightly different. Sure, that's, sure, sure. I've read sure. it like, I've, no, I've, no, I've, I've met, and, and that's the book it's from. So, so my point is, a lot of this is not even... It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's supremacism. I know that's a slight, yes. I'm reaching for the big word, no, but no, what it is, no, is it you is. keep saying hierarchical, but you just mean yes, that there course. is an utterly but, but, implicit uh, and occasionally explicit, but only yes. ever in private, sense that, like a caste system. Yeah, of course. But, but, but the difference is, uh, we know that other societies have a caste system. Yes. We, we know that India has don't. a caste system, and we pretend that we don't. And then we say to the people at the bottom of the caste, whether they're the schemies in East Glasgow, yes, yes, yes. or the former chavs in East London that now long, long exist and have been replaced by West yes, Africans and Bangladeshis, or, or whoever else it is, the, the Irish and the Jews of 100 yeah. years ago, we say to those people, the results of this caste system are entirely your fault and they're yeah. nothing to do with the wider society. And that's why you keep talking about personal responsibility. Yeah, and I'm fine with personal I'm responsibility. I'm going to tell you something. About four or five unfiltered ago, the, the, the comedian Russell Kane was here, who was in a minority at school in Essex. But mm -hmm. I, he, he opened my eyes in a way that hadn't happened before because he, he started seeing a, a, a girl who was much more middle class than he was. She was at university. Mm -hmm. So he started staying mm -hmm. at her halls of residence. He'd been brilliant at primary school, spent all of secondary school pretending he wasn't clever. Which to avoid so get, many poor kids do. To avoid getting his head kicked in, came from right. a poor background. Mm -hmm. And I've never known anyone have this before because with you, this has been, it's impossible to plot the beginning of your journey, your mm -hmm. intellectual journey. It's been endemic to who you are pretty much from I sense from when you could start reading and talking yeah, and going, much, but yeah, certainly yeah. from going to yeah. Saturday school. Yeah, which I went and started going to Saturday school at five. So. There you go. But yeah, go Russell, at the age of about 19, and you can watch the uh, interview, it's an astonishing moment, just looked at his girlfriend's world, people reading poetry on the lawns mm -hmm. of the college, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I won't swear, but he did, basically just said, my birth was a sentence. Of course. He had been... Of course. 
But you see, it's helpful for me to see you both in the same, or what you're describing and what he described in the same way, because it, it completely enforces the point you're making about the poorest people, the people at the bottom of any pile, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of geography mm -hmm. and colour, they are not there by accident. No. And, and, and then we say to the kids who live in East Glasgow, a place that has been structurally poorer than Glasgow's West End for 250 years, yes. You're the reason it's like this. Did they build those housing estates? Yeah. And, that, and, that, and I'm not even saying that a, a totally equal society is entirely possible. I don't no, know. But this is the great but, but, right wing but, weapon. But what it's I'm saying just... is, how, if you think the environment doesn't define you, hmm. let's put it like this. And this is one of the things, actually, I'll, I'll say this on here, even though I, I shouldn't because it's something we've been privately working on, but whatever, right? Let's say we started a boarding school. Yeah. And we took kids from Hackney and Tottenham and Brixton and we put them on a farm in Cambridge. Yeah. Right, feeding shit to pigs, pardon yeah. my language, right? For the whole years of secondary school. Yeah. Is anyone gonna honestly tell me they think the outcomes would be identical to if they stayed in that environment or to take it even more extreme? Would anyone choose who has money to raise their child in a favela in Brazil? Mm. Would anyone make that choice? I've been to the favelas in Brazil. Some of my best friends live there. Mm. No one who's got money is willingly, unless they you know, sure. work there, but yeah. you're not gonna raise your kids in that environment by choice. So when people say your environment doesn't define you, I mean, I, 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 any right-wing version of Signaler who believes that, I publicly challenge them. Yes. I will, I'll, we can bet a sum of money. They can yeah. go and live for one year on Angel Town Estate in Brixton, yeah. right? Or, or in East Glasgow, they can pick. And if at the end of that year, they can still say the society's meritocratic, that your environment doesn't define you, that you, whatever you, if they genuinely, and it has to be during a period of time that is crucial to their child's development. Sure. So let's say the last year of A-levels yeah. or last year of GCSEs, you have to go and live in that environment just for that period of time and see what it does to your personal perception, see what it does to your confidence. See what, none of that excuses the people that live there, but it's no, absurd to suggest that they have the same child. I see it with all my friends. I have friends, I, almost every every boy I was friends with that got expelled from school at 13, without exception, went to prison. Every single one. And the, the former head of the prison service, Martin Neri, he said the 13,000 kids we expel from school every year, we might as well give them a prison sentence then and there. Because the, the correlation is that correct. And then you have these exceptions. But, but Plan B, who was here a month ago, um, actually his life was changed at his pupil referral unit, but you can't hold up people like him. Yeah, but if he wasn't a talented musician... Bingo. What, like, what, everyone, not everyone can write music. No. So if, he, if you're not a talented musician or a footballer... And, and it got discovered. Right, and it got discovered on top of all of yes. that, then you don't become Plan B, you just become another little chav in jail, right? And so it's, it's all of those different forces that I think what, what affects a lot of people and what creates a lot of frustration and rage in Britain it's not that Britain is unequal. Pretty much every society on the planet is unequal. It's the lies that we tell we ourselves. We pretend that it isn't. We pretend it isn't. We pretend that we've, we've yes. achieved. We're not Sweden. And even Sweden's got problems. Of we're not Norway. Are. And even no. Norway's got, we're not Japan. There are countries, uh, similar levels of development. Germany is more, we have, we imprison our population at double the rate the Germans do. And this is one of the ironies of racism, one of the brilliances of it, is that some of the very same people currently demonizing black people as criminals are handing the state power to put their kids in jail. We're 2% of the country. The, Brit the Brit British popula prison population is growing by 82% in three decades. Do we think that's all black people? We don't live in America. No. And so this is the irony of it. It was brilliant. Having a racial scapegoat means that kids in Wales, do you know what IPP is? No. So IPP is when you go to jail and you actually don't know how long you're going to be in jail. You're not given a proper sentence. Indefinite. Right. So you can go in for one year and end up doing 10 years right. or some ridiculous stuff. like This is happening to kids in rural Wales now. But it's because power the state was handed. People were persuaded that we right. need really it's tough power the state was handed. Order. Uh, f basically during the demonization of the Caribbeans and the Irish in the 70s and the 80s. And so a lot of this, you know, the, the kind of c would be dismissed as quote unquote Marxist nonsense. But the irony is when you look at the state's own documentation often, it's there. you find the actual admission and evidence of the very thing that they're claiming isn't, isn't the issue. Well, what is it? I almost hesitate to ask you this, but how complicit then do you think journalists are? Because I, I, I have no... Hesitation in describing people like Kelvin McKenzie or Paul Dacre, the editor of the Daily Mail, as appalling, appalling um, scars upon our national mm. conscience. But, but the idea that they deliberately do this. I don't think everyone sat in a room and said, right, no. we're going to use the phrase black on black violence 54,000 times between 1990 and 2005. I don't, I don't think it's like that. We haven't level even mentioned of, Islam. But, right, I, I, right, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I don't think there's like that level of broad. Pri there might but be. it makes the bell ring. It lights up the light. But, but, but also, it's if, if you employ overwhelmingly a certain set of people from a certain set of background with a certain set of prejudices, mm. along lines of class and along lines of race, you get roughly predictable outcomes. So in school, for example, the state knows 
that black kids are more likely to get expelled yes. regardless of what they do. Like th uh, There was a study, so two studies done, one by Bristol, one by Warwick University, and there's a Department for Education study done in 2004. This is the Department for Education's own study that said when you take every control factor into account, single parent homes, free yeah. school meals, special educational needs, previous expulsions, criminal records, all of that, black kids are still 2.6 times more likely to be expelled. Mm. What could explain such a thing? Mm. No one in any of the solutions is saying, well, should we look at the expulsion rates? Similarly with GCSE entrance and all these other th things that the state knows. I mean, they've seen these reports as much as I have. It's just not everyone who is from a background like mine or yours for that matter has time to sit down and work through all of this documentation. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is what scholars know to be true is not widely often public knowledge. And therefore in the newspapers, a massive scandal like the fact of thousands of kids essentially getting unfairly expelled from school simply because they're black and their teachers believe yes. their trouble is no story at all. The fact that young black kids are significantly less likely to be entered for higher tier GCSE, even when they have the same grades as everyone else. The fact that African kids are assumed to be so much less smart than everyone else, even though they're doing so much better in school. And again, these are national studies looking at every school in Britain. It's mm -hmm. not me. And I'm, I, again, I'm not even blaming individual teachers. We live in a world where the only image of Africa is poverty and violence and war. The image of Africa is not the Ghanaian accountant or David Ajay or, sure. or, 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 or the nicest city in Luanda or wherever else. Right? There's, a, there's a particular image and, and that has an, an effect. What the state does is allow popular prejudice to manifest and say, well, it's not our fault. We that, don't that's, that's what I mean. That's the, that that I, fascinates me, that yeah. chicken and egg element to what yeah. you're describing. Is it, are you pandering to the prejudice or are you creating the prejudice? I, th I think a bit of both. And I, th I, th I think you do a bit of both. I think if the, if the education system, as we've seen with this kind of recent right-wing virtue signaling, yes. if it was producing smarter black kids, yes. you've seen what the reaction has been. The yes. reaction hasn't been to say to working class white kids, well, work as hard as the Ghanaian Nigerian kids. Now, black English kids are failing just as much as the white English kids. Yes. So this is how we know it's, a, it, it's racial propaganda because the same people who, they're not even concerned about the mixed kids. And if it's not bothering me, why would I bother trying to understand it better? If it's not affecting my yeah, you, children, why would I bother trying to articulate and it's it more not, clearly? Again, again when, it's, it's like if I go, so this is one of the things, again, I point out in the book. When I go to Jamaica, when I go back to Jamaica, which I do every year, I'm one of the privileged. Yes, of course. Simply because I'm light skinned and because right. I'm a foreigner, I have an oh, English okay. accent. Yeah. So, one of the legacies of what we call color coded capitalism in Jamaica is that almost all of the people who own all of the property in Jamaica are not dark skinned black people. Right. It's a 90% black country. So, you have sort of a kind of a white hierarchy, but also Syrian, Lebanese. A lot of people don't know we have Chinese people in Jamaica. Yes. And then you have what we call, someone like me is called high color. You have high color, right? And I'm assumed to be upper middle class. Right. I've got boys I grew up with who've killed people, yeah. who've gone back to Jamaica, and everyone assumes they're basically posh. Yeah. Now these are boys from the hood, yeah, in the yeah, English yeah, sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. who've yeah. gone to jail for murder, who just being of light skin, they go back to Jamaica and they get the benefit of the doubt. My dread's complicated, because dreads sure. have certain political and cultural implications in Jamaica. My, my point is I've seen it from the yeah. other side of the fence, where Clearly. if you're an uptown light skin Jamaican, I've had Jamaicans say to me, Jamaica is not violent, because they live uptown. Wow. And they view the police as an instrument of legitimacy, even though the Jamaican police kill civilians. How do you stay so optimistic? Um, because you cut, because also the, the world is also beautiful at the same time. Like I, I think a wise man said to me once, if you ha if the news had to report every good deed that people do, they'd have no space to report anything else. <laughs> so as bad as things can be, I, I actually find solace in under like the book is really about me making sense of my own experiences. And actually I found emotional and psychological solace in knowing the way things work. Ah, uh, yeah, like, uh, like taking something to pieces. Yeah, I don't even take it, I don't even take it that personal. No. Like the, the, the recent stuff with Windrush is appalling. It is, it's stuff that many of us were expecting. We've, sure. Immigration insecurity has been a norm since 1948. So mm. we were not, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Mm. For lots of other people they were. And in, in a way that, that shock registers as how much people haven't really been paying attention. Yes. And it's easy not to pay attention when it doesn't affect you. So I'm not even, like I said, I'm not even blaming necessarily the wider society. But um, I think in terms of optimism, it's it's more to actually, I think it's therapeutic to really understand, well, why what, why did I get in the special needs group? Yeah, yeah. Why was I searched by the police at this age? Same year that I got first got searched by the police was the first year I saw someone get stabbed. You know, one of, one of my closest friends, big brother, got a meat cleaver in the head four times in our local barbershop. And... I was expecting it. Right. This is the weirdest thing. I, yes. I, it was the first time I'd seen something like that. I didn't even stop cutting my hair. I went to the phone the, the, the phone box to phone my friend and say, yo, your brother's been bored up. You better go to the hospital and check him. I came back to the barbers and finished getting my trim and went about my day. I'd never seen that before, sure. but I knew it was coming. 
my little brother's essentially middle class. One of the boys who got killed recently was in his class at school. He knew the family very well. Three of the boys who got killed recently in Camden, he knew them personally. But essentially, ironically, even though he's black, and this is one of the interesting things I've seen in my younger brother, he's 17 today, by the way, happy birthday. <laughs> um, the difference that just having a little bit of money makes. Yes. Right? When I was growing up, my mum was stressed because she spent 29 days of every month trying to figure out how she was going to keep the lights on and keep the rent paid. Mm. It's not that she's not stressed anymore. Sure. And it's not that we're, you know, we're not rich people rich, but my mum is not worrying about whether or not she's going to be homeless or whether or not she can keep the lights on. And I mean, she's an entirely different person because if you all, you, if all that can occupy your headspace is, uh, do I give my kids gas or electric this winter? Which was literally our situation. Yes. How can you possibly be a happy human being having to make that decision on a daily basis? And so I've seen in my little brother a lot of the things that would have affected me, even his, he's just a much nicer person than I am. And I don't mean that in a way to put myself down. When I was his age, if someone spoke to me rudely, it's entirely likely that I would have just punch them in their face. That was, growing up the way I grew up, that was the logical, can't let them take me for an idiot. I'm not a pussy old. No, I'm not having that. Being taken for a dickhead yeah. was worthy of killing someone. It sounds so dumb to people today. And it, but when you have that level of insecurity and fear and aggression, that is the logical response. Well, it, it only sounds dumb for as long as you forget what what is happening at the moment yeah, with, for sure. with regards to violence and, and knife yeah. crime and gun crime. I mean, in fact, it's the opposite of dumb. It would make sense for a lot of people I mean, now yeah, in a way started, that it hasn't before. I started carrying a knife when I was maybe 15 because a grown man at a kebab shop came after me with the kebab shop knife and one of the boys from my area happened to be on hand and he gave me his flick knife. And from then on, I thought, oh yeah, I've seen quite a few people get stabbed by now. Maybe I've seen four or five people get stabbed. Partly that was my own choices. What are the statistics on that? Do you know? Because you, you, you're a bit of a mine of statistics. I, 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 are, you, are you less likely to be a victim of knife crime if you carry a knife? Do we know? Not yeah. probably, but almost certainly not. It doesn't not. necessarily make almost sense, Almost certainly not. <laughs> you're almost certainly more likely I to would be have a victim thought so, if you carry a knife. But of course, it doesn't feel like that when you're... When you're 15. ...staring down the cleaver of... I, I, and also when you're, you know, again, I don't, I don't say that my own personality is in no way responsible. Most of the young black boys I grew up with didn't carry knives, sure. even though they've seen the same thing. So sure. I still, I'm not saying my personal responsibility is irrelevant, no. but my family home, and even that is complicated. My mum and stepdad split up when I was nine. Had they have stayed together, and I don't just mean because they're having a father in the home, yeah. two incomes, yeah, you know, money. less stress. Yes. My mum got cancer the year after he left. Oh, so me and my big sister ha had to take care of my mum. Then when my mum gets better, my big sister no longer wants to be told what to do because she's an adult, essentially. And she's been mum. She that. ends up leaving the home at right, 16, sure. right? And going to live in a hostel. Gosh. All of this vanishes from our broken home, single parent yeah, family. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, actual yeah. what happens to... Fa my mum didn't get cancer or my mum and my stepdad didn't split up. I might have been one of the poor kids who was just poor, but didn't get involved in the violence, didn't get sucked in by, you know, my friends lived in Tottenham and Hackney yes. and Harvesden. So I was the boy from Camden, which has, you know, now become a very rough area. But when I was growing up, it was semi-rough. And actually a lot of the rough gangs in Camden when I grew up were Irish kids, mm. you know, places like Queen's Crescent or mm. um, in Angel around Packington Estate before Angel was um, was gentrified. Those were the people who everyone was like, oh, the Irish boys from Angel, they're about yeah. this life, right? So I, um, I made bad decisions, but those bad decisions were made in a context. And unlike the rest, a lot of the rest of my friends, because I had good GCSEs, because I had self-confidence, because I had this Pan-African support, when I decided to stop making bad decisions, I had the equipment to, to progress. And partly also, you know, our family situation changed. Sure. My, my sister became a pop star. Yes, uh, and that, that provides a sort of security that wasn't like yeah. in the way that you just talked about your mum. I mean, but, she's but not... weir weirdly enough, I, one of my, the problems by that age, I was so egotistical as a young man that I didn't, I, I didn't want to live off my sister. No. And so I was, you know, my, my sister won't know this now, but I was still being a bit of a naughty boy, even when my sister was... When, what do you mean when you say that? Do you mean you were dealing or something? No, no, or... no, no, no. I mean, I, I, I knew people that knew people. Okay. And, and, and sort of, I, I, I became a, 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 how do I say this without without getting myself in too much trouble? I just became a bit of a naughty boy for a period of time. And not for a long period of time, you know, six months, a year. Sure. Sort of, but I don't just mean in terms of activity. I just mean I carried a knife. I was still playing football sort of. Then I left football and then I opened a restaurant and that didn't quite work. So I was sort of what we call a fringe person. I was never ever some kind of bad guy. I don't want to give people the impression that I was some kind of big time gangster. I wasn't. I'm just saying I was around badness. And a lot yes. of my closest friends, one of my closest friends can never come back to England. You know, he came to England at two. And this was different from the Windrush cases because he was a very naughty boy. So he got sure. sent back to Nigeria. He's never allowed back. His whole family's here. But again, his decisions were made in a context. It doesn't yes. excuse him, but it's how do we trace back those steps? If we're actually concerned with solving a problem, which we pretend we are, 
the way I put it to people is like this. We spend astronomical sums of money locking up young people, more than any other country in Europe. Would it be, even if you're just a free market fundamentalist, would it be more economically efficient to provide those families with a bit of extra assistance at age 9, mm. 10, 11, 12, than the inevitable imprisonment that we know is coming at 16? And, and as taxpayers, as people who've become successful, which now includes me, we have to decide which we would prefer. And even if it's just from a right-wing perspective, which is more economically efficient? To spend 80 grand a year, whatever the hell it costs to put someone in prison, it's more than it costs to go to Eton, or to spend a little bit more helping that family in, in the more formative years. It's a new wrinkle, though, isn't there, in America, and, and increasingly so here, in that the, the logic of the answer to that question seems clear until you factor in the third group of neoliberal free marketers who've got shares in a privatised prison system. And then you have these situations in America where judges are practically on commission. There we go. Or you've got people who just deep down don't believe in what they're selling. Yes. They believe in they believe in support for them and their families, but they don't believe in it for other people. So they'll say the market this, the market that, allocation this, allocation that, the state shouldn't be involved. But they're f perfectly happy for state intervention when it comes to other things. So it's, it's also a lot of the time people's professed values are not consistent with their actual behaviour. Which happens to all of us to some degree, by the way. I'm not claiming to be morally no, I, I, perfect, I get that. by the way. I, who, who do you most want to read this book? Um, I, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't young black boys, but it's not exclusively for them because it's not exclusively that story. It does look at... It very much doesn't look at gender so much. No. It, it touches a little bit on masculinity. The reason... And I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get criticised by, by some people for that, and I'm fine with that. I felt that the gender dynamic was better left to better qualified women. I knew a little bit and I've, you know, I've read my little bell hooks, but I didn't want to kind of take the gender angle to be cool and be down with the latest Vogue when yes. I'm not really intellectually qualified. And, it, and ultimately, you say you are intellectually qualified, but you, you don't yet know enough to have arrived at a firm position. But that's position. what I mean by intellectually okay. qualified yeah. in the sense well, of not, the not, not, not that I might not be smart enough. Sure. But if you don't know something about something, you don't know something. I don't know enough about geography to yeah. have an opinion on water systems. But that, and that, that is anti-zeitgeist as well, because I, when I was preparing to talk to you, I wondered... It's weird. I want more people to say I don't know. I think that would actually it's the, make... It's the three most undervalued words in the they? English language. They're absolutely. And more so now than any it other is, point in living memory. Three but most when, but, undervalued words. But when I looked into some of the stuff you'd done, um, your TED Talks and, and, and some of the work, I realised you have immense intellectual confidence on these issues. So to hear you say that about yeah. the masculinity... Uh, issue that is, as you yes. say, unfolding at the moment. That, or, that 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 That's so valuable. Or the politics of Russia. I hear a lot about Russia all the time. I don't know enough, so I stay out of it. Yeah. Until I've actually done some research, I'm not going to give a proper informed opinion. And I think, I think one of the humbling things about writing a book like that is even researching a subject that I, I knew quite sure. a lot about already. Yes. I was like, I'm, wow. compared to some of these people that I'm reading, yeah. people who spent 30, 40, 50 years going through state archives, going through primary so. I have such respect for that process and the diligence it takes for that process that it's made me not less confident, but it's made me more likely to say, I don't know enough about that. Yes. I'll come back to you when I do. I, I, this is it, isn't it? Socrates, I think, the, the more you know, the, 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 yeah, the, the more, more you realise realize you don't know, yeah. or the, the really clever man is the man who realises how little he knows. But this is your, I, I, I mean, it, it's, this is your thesis. This is, had you been to university, your PhD. Yeah, this is in a sense, yeah. the fruits of your learning. Do you ever, yeah. I, I don't know what your answer to this will be. I could normally guess, but with you, it's going to be very difficult to guess. Do you wish you had gone into the world of academia? Yes and no. On the one hand... <laughs> I on, told you it'd be hard to yeah, guess. Yeah, no, it is, because on the one hand, I do. When I teach, yeah. I, I teach at unis quite a lot and, and stuff like that, and I, I do like guest lecturing, and I get very jealous Yes. I think. Even the, the thing is, even Oxbridge, this is the. Sure. We're, I'm, I, I like to think of myself as being able to have a nuanced perspective, even if people I very much disagree with. So when I go to Oxford or Cambridge, it's not like I'm blind to how magnificent these mm. institutions are on the face of it and why the people that come out of them might be a little bit bloody arrogant. Mm. Because they are a phenomenal institutions. Yeah. Whether or not I agree with what their political output, whether or not I agree with their function, knowing you went to the same college as Isaac Newton yeah. is going to make you a little bit arrogant. And, yeah. and that's okay in a sense. I don't think that's abnormal. It's, it's the implications that has for the rest of society. So what I mean, even when I go to some of those institutions, I do think, oh, like, it would have been good to be here battling it out as a student. Yes. On the other hand, a lot of the experiences I went through in the streets, which are why the young boys in Tottenham or Hackney might listen to me and not someone else, I wouldn't have had those experiences. My mum wanted to send me to private school when I was a kid, and I, I resisted it. I was like, I don't want to go to school with just posh white kids, which was basically what I said to her. I was fine with being in school with white kids, but I didn't want to be in school posh. where, yeah, the, the class dynamic just took it too far, right? In fact, in primary school, a lot of my friends were white because the middle-class white kids were the kids who were in the top set. Mm. So ironically, I ended up 
having two very different experiences between mm. primary school and secondary school is one of the things I talk about again, where in secondary school, your experience is getting searched by the police. Differential treatment. That's where it teachers. all changes. You, you, Can you even see in Camden, that? you start. I see it with my little brother. But, 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 my little but, brother's middle class. All of his no, friends virtually. But, but are when you African see Caribbean, yeah. when, when you see that move, because primary school to secondary school seems to be a really underestimated uh, junction in people's lives, mm -hmm. and and it's going to be a more profound junction. I suspect that the the less privilege you have. Mm -hmm. Can you see when 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 a when a young black kid is crossing the line can you see when they're I, going I can, I can see it with any kid i can see yeah. it with bengali kids in tower hamlets who i've also worked with i can see it with brighton has a hood yes of brighton course. lovely brighton in fact the, probably the most difficult kids i've ever worked with was a, a, a young offenders institute or a, a, the what's the one between the young offenders institute between school and prison not a unit something else right it was one of those sort right. of the most difficult group i've ever worked with was in brighton really it was the kids from a council estate in brighton so i can see the turn because I lived it myself, yes. but because then I saw other people in my area. There were boys I grew up with who, at 12 years old, we knew they weren't going to make it to 21, yeah. unless something dramatic happened, unless they were shipped off somewhere. Or, we just knew. So it's not, the kids are not random. What's happening is some of the bad boys are killing random kids who have no, like some of the boys being killed have nothing to do with nothing. Yeah. Wrong place, wrong time. But obviously if you're a young black boy, it's still the feeling that you must have done something. You yes. must be involved somehow. So what happens is, you know, a kid even this happened to one of my closest friend's sons. You know, he's the archetypal middle-class kid. His parents moved out to the suburbs. You know, his dad actually works in gang intervention in the old neighborhood. On, on the face of it, they're the family that made it. Ends up wrong place, wrong time, wrong estate. The kid stabbed him 10 times over something he's nothing to do with. But in a sense, he can never really be a victim because sure. there's this feeling of ethnic implication. Black on black. Right. Yeah. You're somehow ethnically implicated in the crimes yeah. of other black people in a way that other groups of people... Unless right. you're Muslim, which is not an ethnic group, that's a whole other conversation. Or unless sure. you're Irish 30 years ago... You're not, you're not responsible for what the kids in the schemies do in, no. in Glasgow. And so I think it's, I can't remember what the original question was, but- um, About spotting it, seeing the subject yeah, you of can, the kid you on can, the cusp. You can, lit, you can see it at 10, 11, 12, 13, it's very clear. And the worst bit about it is a lot of the time, it's vulnerability that turns to violence. And that doesn't excuse the person in question. The two people I love most in the world are teenage black boys, my nephew and my little brother. The idea that I'm interested in making excuses for people that pose a great danger to them is ridiculous. Yeah, of course. Clearly I'm not. Of course. However, if I thought excessive melanin syndrome would help us, which is essentially what that phrase suggests, would help us to solve the problem, I'd be here for it. But then I'd have to explain why Ghana, one of the poorest and blackest countries in the world, is less violent than London, yeah. for example. Like, where does that fit into the... J Ghana, Jamaica is 30 times more violent than Ghana. 50% of Jamaicans come from Ghana. How do we explain such a humongous differential if this... And Jamaicans, remember, obviously, we have... A, even black Jamaicans. My grandmother, great-grandmother, looks Chinese. Yes. We have a whole load of ethnic mix. So if we're going with sort of social Darwinian yes. race and crime theory... Goes nowhere. Ghana should be more... 30 times more violent than Jamaica, not the other way around, right? <laughs> Especially after 300 years of being governed by Britain versus 70 or 80 or whatever it was for Ghana. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a much more sophisticated explanation that doesn't excuse young boys who are potentially murderers, but also protects the other 95% of the boys and 99% of the boys who pose no danger to anybody. So the things that we haven't talked about. Yes. We can't now. We're bang out of time. Yeah, we haven't talked about, about your music. No, mate, it's been an absolute education, which which I mean quite yeah. literally. Um, we haven't talked about the Shakespeare stuff. We haven't talked Big about... Shakes. <laughs> we haven't talked about all sorts of things. And part of the reason for that, I sense, is that you are, you're on a mission. So bearing in mind, this is the last question. What's next? When's this going out? A couple of weeks. Okay, so that'll be passed by then. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm working on a few different things. Obviously, we've got, we got the book out. Um, I'm working on a young adult fiction, um, actually set in Shakespeare in England. You know, I'm working on a few community-led initiatives as well. You know, it's not just all, you know, talk and scholarship. We're trying to develop a few... Yeah. actual solutions that we hope can get buy-in even from people that would traditionally disagree um, when the evidence is presented in a, in a particular way. Um, so, you know, there's, 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 there's a few little bits and pieces in the pipeline. I won't be putting a new album out until next year because um, music has taken a backseat to, to writing and stuff like that now. But, but yeah, should be good fun. Kayla, thanks so no, much, man. No worries. Anytime. Uh, seriously. Absolutely. Hello, I'm James O'Brien. Thank you for watching this episode of Unfiltered. Not only is there plenty more where that came from, but there's plenty more to come as well. So make sure you subscribe to Unfiltered and put yourself at the front of the queue for all forthcoming interviews.